This video is sponsored by Haybike and Hollyland. Let's face it, astrophotography kits optimized for capturing deep space are often complex and heavy. But in just the past few years, there have been more and more products available that reduce complexity and reduce weight. Mounts with no counterweights, cameras with built-in guiding, telescopes with the correctors built in, lightweight, high-capacity batteries, and most recently, an astrocomputer built into the camera. So I thought, let me request all of these new products at once and assemble the ultimate mobile high-tech deep space kit for 2024. And to really prove just how mobile this thing is, instead of driving to the dark sky site in my car, I'm gonna be using this e-bike and taking you along on the adventure. Many of you watching already know that I actually bought my house right here in a rural part of New Hampshire specifically for the dark skies because I do astrophotography full time. And I now have a backyard observatory that I built myself. You can watch that series. Uh, so you might be wondering, why am I still interested in ultra mobile setups? And there are a number of reasons. One is that here in New Hampshire, there is no one perfect spot because we have so many trees up here. You can see them behind me. So having a super easy to set up mobile kit that I can throw on this e-bike is pretty awesome because there are a lot of cool spots around here to shoot from. So let's break down this kit uh, before we take off for the night. We have the Apertura All Night Imaging Supply to power the kit, the ZWO AM3 harmonic drive mount to track the stars, the Ascar 71F telescope to focus the light onto the ZWO ASI 2600MC Air, which is a camera, a guider, and a computer all in one. And that's the whole kit, just four items. This video isn't sponsored by any of the companies that sent me this gear for review, so it's not sponsored by High Point, ZWO, or Ascar, but it is a sponsored video. It's sponsored by Haybike and Hollyland. <laughs> and uh, Haybike and Hollyland, they sent out this Mars 2.0 fat tire foldable e-bike, and then Hollyland sent out this Lark M2 wireless lavalier mic for me to try out on this whole adventure tonight. And uh, ever since moving here, I've actually wanted an e-bike because there are a lot of cool old logging roads that aren't town maintained. So uh, it means that I wouldn't really want to take my car on them, but an e-bike with nice fat tires and suspension like this is perfect. There's a little assembly required with the Haybike Mars 2, but it's pretty straightforward and all the tools and instructions were supplied in the package. It took me maybe an hour. When Haybike reached out, I wanted to make sure that whatever they sent me could handle both my weight plus the weight of all the astrophotography gear that I plan to uh, put on the bike. And so the Haybike Mars 2 here has a 330 pound max load and 120 pounds of that can be loaded here on the rear rack. I'm using a heavy duty plastic container um, and then I'm just looping these ratcheting straps through the pegboard on the rack to keep it all in place. Okay, and I'm almost ready to go here. Last steps though is I'm going to wear a helmet. A number of years ago, I got into a biking accident where I stupidly wasn't wearing a helmet and I was extremely lucky not to have serious injuries. So I definitely learned my lesson there. And now I always wear a helmet whenever on any kind of uh, bike or motorcycle or e-bike. I'm also um, using this little tiny uh, wireless lavalier mic transmitter on my shirt here so I can record my ride. And I've just added the little supplied uh, wind cover because we're about to hit the road and there's probably gonna be a lot of wind hitting the mic. This is the Hollyland Lark M2. The transmitter here is only nine grams, but it has a very strong magnet on the back to keep it on your shirt. And this kit comes with two of these transmitters and a variety of receivers. I can use the two mics in the kit with an Android phone, an iPhone, or like I am right now with my Sony camera uh, that I'm using to film and record high quality 48 kilohertz, 24 bit sound. The range of this, they estimate in an outdoor situation like this to be a thousand feet or 300 meters. So I wanted to test that. I paced out um, close to a thousand feet down the road here and we'll uh, go, go down there and I'll keep recording and we'll see if it's still picking me up. 
Okay, I'm now give or take a thousand feet away and we'll see if you can still hear me. They uh, say that they have these really cool antennas built into this system so that it um, cancels out the interference that the human body would usually create, which I think sounds really neat. And uh, we'll see how well it works. If, if it really is transmitting crystal clear audio this far away, that's pretty remarkable considering how small this little transmitter is. And the cool thing about using this mic while riding the e-bike is that it has environmental noise cancellation you can turn on in the app, which we'll be trying out right now. So let's go ahead and get going. So here we go. I'm pedaling manually right now, um, which you can do with an e-bike. You can always pedal manually. So even if you run out of battery, you're not screwed. You can always pedal just like a normal bike. You can see I'm already out of breath because it's a very heavy bike. And then I made it even heavier by putting all that astrophotography gear on it. But what is cool about an e-bike is unlike a normal bike, when you get tired of pedaling normally, it has pedal assist mode. So let me turn on pedal assist level of one. And I don't know if you could hear a difference, but it just put on a little uh, motor on the back wheel. And to control the speed, to control, uh, the throttle basically, like you, like in a motorcycle, you'd have the throttle on the handlebar. With an e-bike, it's just through pedaling. So if you pedal faster, if you pedal stronger, it has a torque sensor and a cadence sensor built in. So it knows how you're pedaling and will go faster or slower based on your signals. So if you wanna slow down, you can just pedal slower, which I'm doing right now. If I wanna speed up, I pedal faster. The Hay Bike Mars 2 does come with a smartphone app for changing settings for the bike and for tracking and analyzing your ride. Um, but there's also a bunch of controls right here on the front handlebar, including uh, shifting the pedal assist, uh, turning off and on the headlight, um, sounding the horn, which I'll do right now. Normal bike stuff too, like a normal uh, gear shifter, your front and rear brake and so forth. So remember, I'm recording all the audio on this ride through the uh, Hollyland Lark M2, and I'm wondering how that sounds. Uh, I, I did put the environmental noise cancellation on do strong in the app. Another thing I really like about the Lark M2 microphone that I'm wearing is that it comes with that charging case, and the battery life is pretty incredible. I've, I've tried using it sort of all day in recording, and I had to change out my camera battery a couple times, but the microphone just keeps going and going. So where are we going? Well, this part of New Hampshire is actually pretty hilly. Um, so I'm gonna get up on a hill about three miles away uh, that I've scouted out already, uh, just walking around this area. And uh, the reason to get up there is because then in the southern direction, we should be able to uh, get uh, a little bit above the tree line and actually see uh, Ryan um, much earlier in the night, um, probably around 3 a.m. is what I'm estimating. We've uh, gone about a mile and there's still two miles to go. So I'm gonna turn off the camera here for a second and focus on operating the e-bike and getting us there. Uh, but then I'll, we'll catch back up when we get to the site. Okay, I've arrived to this cool meadow here and uh, we have a great view to the south. It looks like it's gonna be a very clear night. And I'm thinking we can capture what I'd say are the big three in terms of beginner deep space objects for the Northern Hemisphere at least. We'll start with Andromeda Galaxy, then move to the Pleiades Star Cluster, and uh, you know, of course it's embedded reflection nebula, and then end the night with the Orion Nebula. So let's set up this kit and starting with the tripod. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take the AM3 mount head and put that on the tripod here. And you can see that it's uh, rotatable. Um, but when you have it pointed north, when you have this little telescope drawing pointed to the north, then you just lock it down with this locking knob right here. And you also want to attach it more securely. I don't know if you can see this with this little tripod spreader that goes underneath. Okay, and just roughly pointed north is fine if you have like a compass on your phone, just sort of get it rough, roughly pointed north and roughly leveled. Um, 
it, but it doesn't have to be super precise because we're going to use the polar alignment routine in the ASI Air, uh, which will do a really nice job. Now, if you don't have a view of Polaris, the ASI Air does have an alternative. It's an all sky polar alignment feature that you can turn on and try. Uh, but I do have a view of Polaris here, so I'm going to use the normal polar alignment feature tonight. So with this setup, we're ready to actually uh, attach the telescope. Okay, and the Ascar 71F comes with a Vixen style dovetail plate, uh, which is the standard for smaller telescopes like this. And AM3 has a nice spot for that. I'm gonna have to move my camera here. Okay, so we have the As Ascar uh, 71F attached. And there's no need to balance this. This is a harmonic drive mount. I'm going to go ahead and remove the visual back off the Ascar 71F. Um, this was just installed to protect the uh, corrector elements uh, in travel. Um, but we're going to use the photographic adapters that came with the telescope. Okay, here on the camera, I've attached both the photographic adapters that came with the Ascar 71F and the two adapters, both the 21 millimeter and the 16.5 millimeter that came with the 2600 Air. So this whole stack will get us to a nice focus point. Um, so let's go ahead and attach that. Now with a quad like this, you don't have to worry about precise backspacing between the corrector and the camera sensor. As long as you can reach focus, you're gonna have the best correction. This is different than an external corrector like a field flattener, a flattener reducer, or a coma corrector where they typically have a 55 millimeter backspacing requirement. Now, one thing that's a little confusing about that is that even though a quad doesn't have a requirement, that doesn't mean you won't need some spacers here with an astronomy camera to reach focus. Whether you're using an astronomy camera or a mirrorless camera, you're probably gonna need some spacers. If you do use a DSLR, you probably just can get away with just the T-ring. Um, but I can tell you with this configuration, using all the provided spacers that came with the telescope, the Ascar 71F and the 2600 Air, it reaches focus at around three centimeters. So I'm gonna go ahead and rack out the focuser to just shy of three centimeters here. Because I've already tested this and I found you'll reach focus with this combo with the focuser about three centimeters out. Now it's gonna be different depending on which telescope you have. That's just with this particular telescope and, uh, and this adapter stack with this camera. So just keep that in mind. Okay, with the telescope and the mount set up, now we just need to connect three cables, uh, one uh, power out from the battery to the mount, one power out from the battery to the 2600 Air, and then one data cable, a USB, from the mount to the 2600 Air. And that's it <laughs> for this setup. It's really quite impressive. Um, unless you're using like a DSLR and, uh, and on a Star Tracker, I can't think of any setups that have fewer cables than this one. So I realized I spoke too soon when I said three cables. We actually have four cables because I forgot about the dew heater strap, which is sort of a cable. Out here on the East Coast, uh, we always need the dew heater band around the front objective of the telescope up here. Uh, the reason for the dew heater band is to keep condensation, uh, you know, uh, off the front element of the telescope. It really just depends on how much moisture is in the air. If you live out on the west, you may not need this, but here on the east coast, we usually do. And this is the Kubu brand uh, that powers off USB, which the Apertura battery also has available here. So I'm just gonna plug that in. Okay, and then I also have this. This is a uh, Botanov mask. Um, this one is actually for designed for the Rokinon 135, but I found it works fine with this telescope. So they don't have to be super precise as long as they fit on the telescope. And uh, we'll use this later. So I'll just put this in a little pouch here next to the battery. Okay, and now we're all set up and we can just wait for nightfall. Even though it looks <laughs> quite dark, it's actually still dusk out. Um, and I should point out that if you're waiting a while, don't turn the battery on yet. Uh, one really nice feature with this Apertura all night imaging supply is that you can plug stuff in, 
get it all ready, but you don't actually have to turn on the power yet because it has three power buttons and each power button controls a set of ports on the battery. Um, so uh, you can just turn on that set of ports with the appropriate button when you're ready. Okay, I've waited uh, 40 minutes and it's now nighttime. So we're ready to get going. Well, it's not quite nighttime actually, but it's close enough that I'm ready to get going because I can start seeing some stars so we could start polar aligning. And so uh, we're gonna go ahead and supply power to both the camera and the mount and the dew heater band. So let me start with the dew heater band. I'll just press the USB button. And you can see that comes on. And I was using this battery last night and didn't charge it, so it's down to 85%, but that's fine because this thing lasts, for me, many nights on uh, one charge. And then I'm also gonna turn on the DC. Okay, one thing to point out about the USB power, you can see I turned it back on here, and the reason it turned itself off at first is I, be I forgot to turn on this little uh, switch here, which, um, it actually turns on the dew heater band. So now that this is on, it will actually stay on. But if, it's, if it doesn't think that it's using any power, it turns itself off. So just be aware of that. But now you can see both the USB and the DC for the mount and the camera are both on and we're ready to go. Okay, so the rest of this tutorial is gonna basically be on the mobile device because uh, we're gonna be controlling this entire rig with the uh, ASI Air app, which connects to this 2600 Air camera. Um, so we'll, I'll uh, keep talking you through it, but we're gonna, instead of seeing my <laughs> face, you'll now see my iPhone. So the first thing we wanna do is to go to your mobile devices setting and uh, then turn, go to your Wi-Fi settings and connect to the 2600 Air Wi-Fi network, will, which will be something like 2600 air and then some random digits and, and letters. And I should mention, I don't have cell signal out here. So if this was my first time connecting to the camera, I'd wanna actually be somewhere where I have cell signal or I'm within range of my home Wi-Fi because the first time you connect to it, it's gonna want you to register the device and update the firmware. And you'll need internet uh, for those things. Okay, but I've already done those ahead of time, so I can just open the ASI Air app and say enter device, and it gives me some settings options, and you can change all of these later, but you might as well get them right right now. Uh, for the guide camera, we're gonna pick the ASI 220, and for the main camera, the ASI 2600. And these sensors are both inside the camera, which means the focal length of the main scope and the guide scope will be the same. It's whatever your focal length of your telescope is. So in this case with the Ascar 71F, it's 490 millimeters focal length for both. I'm not using a filter wheel or an electronic autofocuser, so we don't have to worry about setting up those. And I'm not gonna show my location here, I have it blurred out, but your mobile device should be able to pull this automatically from the GPS receiver. But if you are using a tablet that doesn't have GPS, you may have to enter the coordinates manually, which you can just look up online ahead of time. Okay, all these settings are good, but once we're actually in the app here, there are a number of other settings that I like to change right off the bat. I'll put the gain for the main camera, the 2600, on medium, which puts it at gain 100, which is the gain I recommend for everything for this camera, whether you're doing broadband or dual narrowband or whatever. I always use gain 100 with this particular camera. And I'm going to set the cooling at negative 10 Celsius. It's already getting pretty cold here at night in New Hampshire, so we should have no trouble hitting negative 10 consistently. For the guide camera, since we are at F7, or about F7 with this telescope, and we're gonna be using short guide exposures since that's what ZWO recommends for the AM3, I'll put the guide camera on high gain, which in this case is 350. I'm also gonna go here into the advanced guide settings and turn on dither and set it to dither five pixels every single exposure. And that may be excessive, but I find that a high dither really helps knock out any pattern noise, and the AM3 can recover very quickly from a high dither, so it really doesn't eat up much imaging time, is what I've found. Okay, with all those things set, we can now check focus here with a quick preview exposure. And because I was using this kit on a previous night and I know how far to rack out the focuser, this already looks pretty good, good enough for, for polar alignment. 
But what do you do if you take a test exposure and you see nothing like this? Well, that typically means you're well out of focus and you just got to start methodically racking the focus out from zero until you can start seeing some out of focus stars like this probably Polaris there. And then once you see that, then start moving the focuser in smaller increments until you have nice tight small stars like this. And then the final step would be checking that focus with the Badenov mask, but let's wait on that because I like to do that right before we start the imaging run, uh, just to make sure the, the telescope is cooled down and everything is good. So as long as you're roughly in focus, we can go ahead on to polar alignment, which we just tap here on preview and change the mode from preview mode to PA, polar alignment mode. And on the ASI Air, the polar alignment mode guides us through how to do it. Uh, you're gonna be using the mount's altitude and azimuth adjustments, the little knobs, uh, which are on the equatorial uh, wedge. And that will physically position the mount until it's aligned with the North Celestial Pole, or the South Celestial Pole if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. And this takes practice for sure, but after you do it many times like I have, you're gonna get faster hopefully. You can start polar aligning before it gets truly dark, so uh, you aren't really wasting any imaging time in polar aligning. So don't really sweat it if it takes you 10, 15 minutes, it doesn't matter, as long as you uh, start you know, at dusk. Okay, and then we just type in the first object of the night here, and I wanna start with the Andromeda Galaxy, which is Messier 31, M31. And after you find uh, Andromeda in the ASI Air, and say, you'll wanna say Go To, which is in the lower right-hand corner here, and the AM3 and the 2600 Air will work together to find it for you and center it. And it might take one or two attempts uh, to do that. Okay, now I'm gonna set up the auto-guiding because uh, whenever we rotate the 2600 air, it rotates the guide ship as well. And then any calibration, any guide calibration that you used before is now worthless. And so we have to let the uh, ASI air recalibrate the guide ship, which just means knowing its orientation vis-a-vis -vis the mount. Okay, and with that done, guiding looks like it is now working well. So I'll just stop it for now. We can turn it back on when we get uh, done with the next step, which is making sure that we're in really good focus. So I put the mask on and I'm gonna take a three second exposure and then I'll just pinch in on the screen to zoom in. And we can see that we're quite close to focus. Um, this middle line is a little bit to the left of center. And so we just need to move the focus position just slightly to get it centered. Now that first time you move the focus knob, you don't really know <laughs> which way to move it. It's a 50-50 shot, whether you focus in the right direction or the wrong direction, because it depends on the orientation of your sensor and the orientation of the mask. So it's, it's too hard to like figure that out ahead of time. And so just guess which way to go and uh, looks like we moved in the wrong direction. So I'm gonna move the focus position in to get the uh, center line to move right, because I know that it's now right, and I'm using the 10 to one reduction knob uh, with the, or also called the fine focuser on the ASCAR 71F because we're very close and we just need a little bit of an adjustment to nail it. Okay, and there we are, this looks good to me. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and lock that focus position with the little locking thumb screw on the bottom of the focuser and then check one more time that that test exposure still looks good after I've locked in the focus position. And yes, it does. So we're good to go. I'll take the mask back off, that's important. And I'll take one more test exposure at 10 seconds long just to make sure I like the framing and nothing looks amiss. I also actually do this so I just get in the habit of doing this to so that if I, for, you know, I don't forget to take off the mask. Because once in a while you'd forget to take off the mask and then you you know, your whole first three minute exposure is bad. So if you just always take a 10 second test exposure after you focus, it's a good habit to build if you're using a bottom up mask. And anyways, this 10 second exposure looks perfect to me. Um, so ASI Air has two different ways to run a sequence of images, the auto run mode and the plan mode. And the plan mode is better if you wanna leave it, you know, unattended and go right on from one object to another. But since I'm gonna be right here taking part in all of this, I'm just gonna use the simpler auto run mode tonight. And I do want Meridian Flip on, uh, and so I'll toggle that on. So to use this, just tap the plus button here 
And then I just wanna take lights. And lights just means taking photos of your deep space object. So in this case, Andromeda. And I'll say 180 seconds, that's three minutes. And let's do 30 of uh, those exposures. So it'll be 90 minutes total. And that should give us a pretty good picture. And I want the default gain because I already set it at gain 100. And that's it. We can exit out of this screen by just pressing the little um, arrow in the upper left. And then we can press this start button to start the auto run sequence. And I'll just fast forward here. And this is our first image, our first three minute exposure. And it definitely looks good to me. Um, this sort of shows you the quality of this kit here. Uh, you know, nice tight stars, no apparent color fringing, very nice details for a single exposure. Um, you know, it's gonna, it looks pretty low noise, really good overall. Um, and I'll, I'll share the final image after processing at the end of the video. But for now, let's just jump ahead to uh, the next target. So uh, after 90 minutes with M31 done, we can now jump over to M45, the Pleiades. So uh, just type that into the search here in preview mode and go to it. And we'll check our focus just like we did before. We'll reset our auto run just with this little reset button here in the upper right and hit start. And it's as simple as that. We can, you know, you can make things more complicated, but I just enjoy the simplicity sometimes of this, you know, ASI Air and this mobile setup. I just think the pictures coming back down, you know, look pretty, really good. And so there's no reason to make it more complicated than it needs to be. And so now I just have to stay up another 90 minutes, not fall asleep. Uh, but it's, I don't think I will because it's actually a really nice night out. I'm just going to enjoy some stargazing here and I'll catch up with you when the Pleiades is done. Okay, it's now 3.15 a.m. <laughs> and I can now see the Orion Nebula visually in Orion's sword over there just above the tree line. So we can start, you know, taking pictures of it with our telescope. It's the same deal as before. All I'm going to do is uh, check focus. I'm going to go uh, reset the auto run and uh, here's our first image and wow yes I always blown away when I see Orion uh, this is my first one for the season on September 5th and uh, I'm always just so happy on my first uh, picture of Orion when it comes back that was a really fun full night of imaging with this kit and I gotta say it all went very smoothly <laughs> you know I, I think I will feature these products in other reviews and videos after using them more. But I gotta say, as just a first run with these, uh, based on what you just saw, you know, these all work together really well. No real issues came up for me. And I know, you know, when people watch these videos, they know that I have a lot of experience with astrophotography. So I'm not trying to say that no uh, issues will come up for you if you're more of a beginner, but. Um, this is a really sleek kit that I think guides you through it all pretty easily. And there's less to worry about because there's fewer cables and fewer items, you know? It's just, it's basically just the four things, like I've said. Okay, so I'm all packed up and back on the road, headed home. And it was definitely an amazing night. Uh, it's getting a little light out now, which is good, so I can see the road a little bit better. But I still do have my uh, white headlamp on here, also illuminating it. And I want to thank again Haybike and Hollyland for sponsoring this video. Hope you had a nice time just checking out this ultra mobile deep space kit. And you're now seeing everyone who supports this YouTube channel over on patreon.com slash nebula photos. It's a truly stellar community of amateur astrophotographers at all different experience levels, but all people who wanna learn and many people who are also willing to share their expertise. There's an active Discord you can get involved in where I run a monthly imaging challenge that was, as you saw, the genesis for this video. And the generous support of my Patreon members, it's what allows me to do this full time and to make these in-depth videos like the one you just saw. So if you enjoy this YouTube channel, I think you're gonna get a lot of benefit out of joining my Patreon community, which starts at just $1 a month. 
and you get direct messaging support with me, a monthly Zoom chat with the whole community, the monthly imaging challenge, and a whole lot more. So if interested, head over to patreon.com slash nebulaphotos. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.